All right, so today I'm here to talk to you about terrestrial biomes, which are large pieces of land that have both living and non-living things interacting together to make up this huge system. So let's get started. Okay, so during this presentation, I want you just to think about why and how are there different biomes on Earth? So why is it here in Los Angeles we have the chaparral biome? But if you go up north, 400 miles, you have taiga. Just keep that in your mind when we're going through this. How and why are there different biomes here on Earth? Okay. Um, so... Last lecture, we talked about biomes and how they are group ecosystems working together. But why are there certain biomes and areas? Well, there's a lot of different characteristics that determine what biome is where. So first, you have to look at the climate, which we're going to do today in this lecture. You have to look at the geography. So where is it placed in the world? What about the latitude? So at what point above or below the equator is this biome found? The altitude, how high is the biome in the air? Um, what are the soils made of? And what nutrients can be found in the soils and in the waters of these biomes? So we're gonna go through um, the big biomes that are found on land and discuss some of these components that give each biome its unique characteristics. Okay, so you might have seen this um, diagram, but it kind of shows all the main biomes here on Earth and then how they are distributed based upon precipitation, uh, temperature, and latitude. All right, so the first biome that we're going to talk about that is at the highest latitude and it is the coldest is the tundra. What makes the tundra a unique biome is that Underneath the soil, there's a layer of permafrost. This permafrost is like a frozen layer of soil. It makes it very difficult for large plant species to grow because the water is frozen. It's not freely available. So it's very difficult to tap into the water source underneath the ground of the tundra. So if you look at a tundra landscape, there's oftentimes a lot of short, small, bushy shrubs. Okay, again, it's the furthest one north, um, away from the equator. Okay, so here's a picture of the tundra summer. Um, it's very barren, very small shrub-like species that exist. And then compare that to the tundra winter. So the tundra winter, pretty barren again, very white with snow, um, not much life. Some of the organisms that live in the tundra have adapted to these harsh conditions. So for example, here is a picture of an Arctic fox. And uh, what makes it unique to the tundra is that in the winter, the Arctic fox develops this white coat, but in the summer, it will change into a darker coat. We also have the musk ox. They live in the tundra. And again, you can see what their adaptation is to living in this biome. That is a lot of fur. Uh, <laughs> to keep themselves very warm in these cold conditions. People do unfortunately <laughs> like to go to the tundra and hunt. Um, so here's a picture of hunters in Alaska with a swan. And also the tundra is very famous for its oil. Um, up at the very northern part of Alaska, there's a section called Prudhoe Bay. And the big oil companies have uh, oil development places there, and they pump oil out of the ground and they send it down to the south of Alaska through a pipeline called the Alaskan Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. Um, it's delivered usually to Exxon, I'm sorry, <laughs> to Valdez, and then other companies and boats pick it up from there. All right, our next biome is the taiga. It's sometimes referred to as the boreal forest or the coniferous forest. They're all pretty much, for our case, the same. Um, 
In this biome, you have a lot of conifers, which are evergreen trees. So things like pine trees and fir trees, those are all conifers. Um, this biome is usually found below the tundra and it's very famous for its colder winters and cool summers and lots of rain. Um, the rain really helps keep those plants green throughout the year. Species you can find there, we got the bears, you have moose. Um, this is a marmot. Very and what do we tend to use this biome for? A lot of timber production comes out of the taiga, specifically from Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. That's where a lot of the big paper companies are and, and wood lumber products come from there. So that's what this biome is for. Also, uh, along the Columbia River, there are tons of dams and they are used to produce electricity for the region. Um, this leads us to our next biome, which is the temperate deciduous forest. A deciduous means to drop, so these um, plants in this area tend to drop their leaves in the fall. And you might be asking, well, why do they do this? It is an energy saving device. So they drop their leaves in the fall because that's when sunlight becomes less available for these organisms um, and they need sunlight in order to photosynthesize. Their leaves are the main photosynthesizing tools. So they drop them to conserve energy because they're not photosynthesizing. And then in the spring, they'll grow them back and start to grow again. So it's kind of almost like they're hibernating or shutting down for the winter. Um, in the United States, you can find temperate deciduous forests on the East Coast. They're very common in places like New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, states along that area. Um, of course, you can find raccoons anywhere, but definitely find forests, salad, bear, elk. And what do we use this for? A lot of logging, unfortunately, comes from the East Coast deciduous forest. I read some statistic that said most of the forests in in the area of the East Coast um, have already been logged. And so all the regrowth is just a secondary forest. There's really no primary forest left on the East Coast. Another thing that they're used for is mining. So we do extract materials from deciduous forests. And then that leads us to the temperate grassland. Um, in the temperate grassland, you have fertile soil. That means that the soil has many nutrients to it. The grassland is, is famous for its hot summers and cold winters. If you want to think of Kansas and Nebraska, they have temperate grasslands and they tend to be found at mid latitudes. So the in-between range is like 20 to 30 degrees. They'll, you'll, be, you'll find them at 25 degrees latitude, 15 degrees latitude. So in between the latitudes. What do we use grasslands for? Of course, agriculture. You know that the Midwest is the bread basket of America, so a lot of our products come from there. They're also uh, known for a lot of grazers. So an example of a grazer is this bison here. Grazers, they tend to walk around and graze for many hours of the day. So they just eat the grass in the grasslands biome. Unfortunately, the grasslands biome is one of the most overused biomes um, because we have used the soil so much, we've depleted of nutrients, we have to add fertilizers to it to become fertile again, and um, there are issues like desertification and soil erosion that occur in the grasslands. Um, we also, since there's a lot of farming going on there, there's a lot of pesticide usage because we need to kill off the pests for our food. There's a lot of animal feces that runs off into the waterways. And of course, tons of energy and water is used to support this agricultural um, industry. Right. This is a picture of what's called a CAFO. It's a concentrated animal feeding operation. And you will find these a lot in the grasslands area. 
Um, you'll also find them in other biomes as well, but they are concentrated in the grassland biomes. Um, when you have a lot of grazers in a small area of space, they tend to compact the soil. Their hooves, they're very flat. And so when they're walking around on the soil, they kind of press it down and then make it almost cement-like. So anytime it rains or there's an addition to nutrients into the soil, it runs right off the soil and into the nearest waterway. And so that leads to almost desert-like conditions of the soil. And that's why it's called desertification because the, the soil is depleted of oxygen, of water, of nutrients, and thus it's pretty much just dead. All right, the savanna is another biome that is made famous by the Lion King. It's found near the equator. Um, it has very dry, hot summers and cold winters. And of course, it's known for things like cheetahs and elephants and organisms. <laughs> um, we also have the tropical rainforest, which is another biome. It's, it's um, definitely my favorite along the equator, so zero degrees latitude. It tends to be the warmest uh, average temperatures in the biome. Um, it has low nutrient soils, and that is because a lot of the plants take up the nutrients quickly, and so it depletes the soil of those nutrients. Lots of rain occurs here, and they pretty much have stable warm temperatures all year round. Um, one thing you'll find in the rainforest are these large broadleaf uh, plants. And the reason why they have these large leaves is to capture as much sunlight as possible. Um, the sunlight is definitely limited in the rainforest because you have these huge canopies that block the sunlight to the lower levels. So an adaptation that the plants have had is to uh, make these big leaves to capture as much radiation as possible that they can get. This is a white-handed gibbon in Thailand that is home, I mean, calls the rainforest its home. And of course we have the jaguar and the sloth. And what do we use tropical rainforest for? A lot of our medicines have come from plants in the tropical rainforest. We've also unfortunately used it for lumber products, and that has led to a lot of deforestation. Um, why is deforestation bad? Why is it bad to cut down a whole bunch of trees? Well, it increases the concentration of CO2 in the air. And what do people then use the land for once they've cut down the trees? A lot of times it's for cattle grazing or um, for agricultural purposes. And that has a whole long list of environmental issues as well. One technique that was made very famous just last year was the slash and burn technique in the Amazon. And this is when you pretty much cut down um, the vegetation in the biome and then you set it on fire. And the reason why you let it burn is because you want all those nutrients that were in the plant to go into the soil. And then what people will do is they'll come back in, farmers usually, and plant things in the soil because now the soil has tons of nutrients. Remember how I told you in the rainforest, there's usually not a lot of nutrients in the soil because the plants take them up. So using this technique, you can get the nutrients to return to the ground. However, totally not sustainable. It only lasts for about two to three years and then the nutrients are gone. Okay, the next biome is the temperate rainforest. And this is like the tropical you do get rain, um, but it's not as warm as what you picture the tropical rainforest to be. These ones tend to be found close to the mountains, I'm sorry, coastal mountains. So definitely much nearer to the coast than you find the tropical rainforest. Um, and also they're not as very popular if you can see. So for example, we have temperate rainforests up near Washington and Canada, like Vancouver area. And of course, if you just think about that, you know it's colder than you know, Ecuador, for example, where you find the tropical rainforest. All right, the one that we live in is the chaparral biome. It's also known as the Mediterranean biome 
or the shrub lamp biome. Those are all just synonyms for chaparral. The plants here um, have adapted to fire conditions. We have mild wet winters and warm summers, and this tends to be a biodiversity hotspot. There's a lot of species that exist here in this biome. Um, it's only found in five places of the world. So it's found in the Mediterranean region, it's found in Chile, in Southern California, in South Africa, and Australia. Organisms that you can find here are the western fence lizard, you have the um, rattlesnake, and the mountain lion. And this is a cool little plant called the manzanita. Um, it's definitely a fire dependent plant. In the California. What have we used the chaparral for? Um, unfortunately, here in LA, for urbanization. So we've built a lot of homes in the chaparral biome. That has led to many problems <laughs> the loss of habitat, the introduction of non native species, air pollution, water pollution, the increase in so forth. <laughs> All right, deserts are our last biome, and deserts tend to be actually quite warm, right? And they have a lot of drought adapted plants. Um, deserts are sometimes found on the backside of mountains, and the rain shadow effect, and we can see that here in California. Um, imagine this little water here <laughs> to be the Pacific Ocean. And so from the Pacific Ocean, which we call the windward side, it brings up a lot of cool, moist air into the area. Well, it kind of comes up and then it hits mountain ranges and it causes the water to come up and up and then it releases that water into this side of the mountain. However, once the, uh, the air gets all the way to the top of the mountain, there's no moisture left in the air. And so when it descends, it's very dry. So usually on the back sides of the mountains, you'll see these dry conditions, which are very desert-like. And we call that the leeward side. Um, here, just locally in Southern California, you have areas like Malibu and Ventura and, and Santa Monica. That's, very, that's the windward side the cool air goes up over the Santa Monica Mountains and then there's no moisture left on the backside and that's where you get the San Gabriel Valley, which is very warm conditions. All right, so that um, deserts can usually be found 30 degrees north or south of the equator. And the reason for that is you just take a look at this diagram. You have warm, moist air that rises off the equator. Well, when it rises, it eventually cools because it's colder higher up in the atmosphere. When it cools, it will eventually descend in what's called a Hadley cell. So cool air descends because it's heavier, and it usually descends about 30 degrees north or south of the equator. Some organisms that you can find in deserts are meerkat and the desert tortoise. All of these organisms have adapted to living in low uh, moisture conditions. They either store water for long periods of time or they burrow themselves at, and during the day to escape the heat. Um, each one obviously is very specific. Um, what have we used deserts for? Well here locally we've used them to mine. So a lot of minerals come out of the desert. And the last thing I want you just to remember is that biomes are dynamic. So they do change when environmental conditions change. They're not always the same. So if you look at tropical rainforest 200 years ago versus now, there are some environmental conditions that cause the biomes to change. Just keep in mind that biomes are dynamic. They're not always stable. Um, and that concludes our lecture on biomes, terrestrial biomes. So. I hope that was good. <laughs> All right. Bye.